Mr. Chair, it is 5.30 if you're ready to call the meeting to order. Okay, welcome everyone. 5.30, we're calling the October 1st Ward 3 NAB meeting to order. Can I get a roll call? Elia Ar Arbutman? Here. Uh, Gabriel Maya? Not here, right? Absent. Absent at this time. Mary Rodriguez? Here. Thank you. Zachary Bolton? I'm present. Jarrett Singh? Absent at this time. And alternate Shanda Golden. Here. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Clerk. Let's move into item 8-2, public comment. Mr. Chair, our first item today is public comment. Members of the public may hear, observe, and provide public comment virtually by registering through the following link, which can be found on reno.gov slash meetings. And the link is https slash slash links dot reno dot gov forward slash four a x r m w t comments heard under this item will be limited to three minutes per person and may pertain to matters both on and off the nab's agenda the nab may not take action upon any matter not agendized on today's agenda when you are called on for public comment please state your name for the record and begin speaking the timer will begin when you say your name and you will be afforded three minutes if you're an attendee in the Zoom meeting and would like to make public comment, please raise your hand at this time. Okay. And uh, Mr. Chair, we don't have anybody registered for public comment. Okay, sounds good. Um, we'll move into A3, approval of the agenda today. It looks like we got kind of three items. Uh, do I have a motion to approve? I motion that we approve the agenda for today. I, Zach, a motion to approve it okay or i have a motion second. a second all in favor aye all opposed okay the agenda is approved and then moving on to a4 our minutes yes. i apologize yes, yes. Uh, we have a hard stop time today at 6 50 we gotcha. have we won't have internet access at 7 p.m okay for maintenance thank you okay so we'll we'll um we'll get through this um uh, item A4, approval of the minutes from August meeting. If everyone has a chance to glance at those and then let me know and I have a motion to approve. Mr. Chair, Marie Rodriguez, for the, media, for the record, um, I would move that we approve the, the minutes from the August meeting. Okay, do I have a second? Uh, second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Okay, minutes are approved. I don't see Council Member Martinez here, so I think, guess we'll skip the Council Liaison Report. Do we have a staff report, item A6? We don't have anything, Mr. Chair. Okay, sounds good. So we'll move on to business. The first item today, B1, we're going to get an update on Title 18 Zoning Code Cleanup. It's on when it's green. There we go. There we go. My name is Lauren Knox. I'm a senior planner with Development Services, and I'm here tonight to talk to you about the zoning code cleanup and just give you a little update on where we're at with this process. There we go. Okay, so just to start with some background, in 2022, City Council initiated a text amendment directing staff to begin cleaning up portions of our development code, which really stemmed from, um, we did a rewrite in 2021. And so with that full rewrite, it was anticipated that there's gonna be quite a few things in there that we wanna make sure we keep an eye on and track and, and come back with some fixes. Um, staff had been tracking these items that were basically unclear, inconsistent, difficult to implement, or just didn't make sense. The zoning code cleanup was really focused on these items and finding ways to better implement our code. So this included items such as grammatical errors, there were some inconsistencies, there were some items that were being interpreted differently from staff. Um, we tightened up some restrictions to protect neighborhoods, simplified certain regulations that became really confusing or difficult for us to administer. And then also we had the 2023 legislative session. And so there are some items out of that session that we needed to include in our development code. 
There are also a variety of items that are not part of this effort. So some of these items are either separate text amendments. Um, some of these items were also included in this, but we've since taken them out because they've become larger than just a cleanup. So that includes accessory dwelling units, short-term rentals, again, separate ordinances, changes to our noise ordinance, potential changes, I should say, changes to tree protection standards. That was one that was included, but we've taken it out because we've got a lot of feedback on that. Updates to the sign code, same situation, and then updates to our telecommunication regulations. So we first came to the NABs in June of 2023 and have since held a variety of engagement efforts and stakeholder meetings, including technical advisory committees. We went to the Historical Resources Commission. We had some smaller, um, more sp specified meetings, I should say. We had nine public stakeholder meetings. We've been to the Planning Commission multiple times as well as City Council. So we tracked over 400 items that needed to be addressed. Um, there are about 660 pages worth of red lines, but I'm just going to summarize some of these kind of bigger topics that are in the, the code update. So in terms of use allowances, we cleaned up the table of allowed uses to make it less confusing. We used to have this one, two, and three, four designation. Um, it had a variety of entitlement options. We tried to clean it up to make it more, more clear in, in terms of how that's administered. We also had certain uses that were appropriate in certain locations or maybe not as appropriate in other locations or required additional review. So we tried to clean that up and make that a little bit more consistent. And then we also have our use specific standards. So these are kind of additional standards on certain uses. And we tried to go through those and, and clarified or added to certain uses that maybe needed it. For example, we didn't have any standards for car washes. So we tried to put some, some standards in there that made sense. So for development standards, current code limits the number of stories as well as height. So typically height really drives that design and impact. So we shifted to just the use of height versus stories. That's more consistent with other development type codes. We also um, had quite a bit of confusing language in terms of lot and building standards. We had a whole bunch of footnotes on tables and it was just very confusing to administer. So we tried to clear that up a little bit as well. For protection in neighborhoods, we've seen an increase, increase issues in this arena, basically. So we attempted to introduce a bit more to protect neighborhoods. So that includes some additional use restrictions. I had talked about those use specific standards before. So things like loading docks, car washes, items that can kind of impact the, the residential fabric, we tried to include some, some development standards on. Increased our residential adjacency buffer requirements to 300 feet from residential zones as the trigger versus what we have currently in code is 150 feet. We added some more compatibility requirements and then um, additional setback or step back requirements for certain heights of buildings to try and not have those towering buildings over single family neighborhoods. For changes to industrial type businesses, we introduced some compatibility issues or some compatibility pieces here to address some of the issues that we've heard. Um, we've reduced some of the areas where certain uses are allowed, for example, indoor manufacturing, processing or assembly, warehouse and distribution. We had some of those permitted in locations that maybe didn't make a lot of sense. Um, we've been seeing data centers as a new use come up, so we tried to address that in the code. We may be seeing more of those. We tried to add some additional use standards. Again, I kind of talked about that earlier, but to try and help mitigate those impacts between uses, um, things like requiring our loading docks to be screened or mitigated. For screening, so we tried to introduce a little bit more protection between uses here. So for our screening standards, we used to have it from zoning district to zoning district. What was difficult with, with that is we have a lot of mixed use districts. And so those uses, sometimes you'd have a, a commercial use right up against a residential use. So we tried to make this more use based. That way you can have a little bit better protection against uses. For fencing, we really just tried to clarify this section of code to be clear on, on what fence standards apply to which zoning districts. Um, we also had a bill that passed in the legislative session requiring us to permit battery charged fencings with certain requirements. So we put that into code as well to be in compliance with the Nevada revised statutes. For lighting standards, it was another confusing item for us. So there's multiple ways to measure lighting and we removed the measurement for lumens because there's not actually a way for us to measure lumens in that way. Um, most development codes don't have that. Uh, we look at things like foot candles and Kelvins, which we've kept in code. So we're again, trying to make this enforceable and implementable. Uh, light 
lots within 100 feet of residential zoning districts. We've limited to 18 feet, again, that, that residential adjacency component. And then spillover requirements were expanded to all properties instead of just adjacent to residential properties, again, for those kind of side-by-side -side pieces to make sure those compatible uses are um, a, a bit more compatible. I think this stopped working. <laughs> Thank you. Um, schools have also been a topic of conversation recently. So we've had certain items that are required to be consistent between jurisdictions. We've maintained those. We haven't touched those certain requirements. Um, but we are trying to address certain issues that have come across by creating basically one school category and saying, OK, if we're over 400 students, so that's a little bit higher of a capacity, we want to be able to see that through a conditional use permit process. So that would be going to the NABs, going through the Planning Commission process, because we've had an, a number of issues um, related to school school siting. So one of the big things we also added was a little bit more standards to better address circulation and loading. Our drop-off and pickups sometimes can back up onto streets. This can cause pedestrian safety issues. So we're just trying to address this in a little bit different of a way so we have a little bit more uh, review on these items. For definitions, we really just cleaned them up. We had some missing definitions, some that needed a little bit of work or updating. Um, we also clarified certain rules of measurement. And then a big thing is we alphabetized the definitions. They used to be separated by use, which was very confusing. Um, again, more in line with what other zoning codes do and, and easier for the user on the other end. So with that, if you're seeking more information, uh, visit our, our website. We have all of the red line changes there. Again, it's a 660-page annotated document, so there's quite a bit of information there if you're interested at all. Um, anyone could submit public comment at any time through a variety of outlets. And again, just reach out anytime if there are any questions or anything that you'd like to, to make a comment on with that. Our next step, so we're collecting some additional feedback. Um, we anticipate a formal adoption this fall and winter. So again, we're going to all of the NABs this October, then we plan to go to the Planning Commission and then the City Council. So with that, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you, uh, Ilya Arbutman for the record. Yeah, just a general question about feedback. Because there's so much in there, um, what's the strategy? I mean, I think soliciting feedback is challenging because you know nobody is really equipped, first of all, because it's hard to understand for lay people, but also because it's so big, the document. Yeah. So do you guys have a strategy to sort of um, either, I mean, this presentation is great, but maybe like one step beyond that, you know, or just to sort of dumb certain things down or maybe to target certain groups that are affected because I feel like the NABs, are, we're, we're only going to capture a very small sure. part of it. Yeah, we've tried to throughout this process, and I can probably go back to that beginning slide. We did try to target those certain smaller meetings, so those specific groups that have key interests. We tried to take kind of this bigger piece and boil it down to, okay, what are those factors that those smaller groups really um, are keen on or have a technical understanding of, or, or where should we really start to target so that we can try and condense some of these portions into the smaller groups. So we did quite a few smaller meetings um, as well. We also, I know, it's, I know it's a lot, but in the full document, we've tried to explain why we made the certain changes we did. In all of our staff reports, we've also tried to keep it high level in terms of the summary of, okay, here are the big things we've talked about. Here's where you can dive down. So we've tried to give the information in a variety of ways with the acknowledgement that there's a lot of different audiences with a lot of different kind of expertise or um, touching of these items. So we did try to hit those smaller meetings with those more targeted pieces. Oh, thank you. Forgive me if it seems ignorant, but what is a battery charged fence? Sure. So that is an electric fence, so an electrified fence. Um, there are requirements. It's not like you can have a battery charged fence right on the sidewalk and a kid can touch it and get zapped. So there are requirements that there's a fence and then there's a five foot um, space between the actual electrically charged fence. We don't see a lot of these. Um, a lot of times they're in more industrial areas or areas where say there's like a commercial lot and they're trying to protect what's inside of it. So there's certain voltage requirements. You have to have a lot of signage, but it's an electrified fence. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Marie Rodriguez, for the record. Um, 
You mentioned the full document. Is that like the zoning code document? Yeah. How big is this document? And when you talked about um, going online, is it available to review online? Yes, it is available to review online. It is about 660 pages. Um, it is very large. Uh, it's broken down basically section by section. So if there's specific things you're interested in, there's a way to, to navigate it, but it is a very large document. And again, if we did make a red line change, you can see where that change is in the document, whether it's a deletion or an insertion. And then we've also annotated it. So we said, okay, this is why we did this. So again, try to make it as user-friendly as possible, but it is a lot and it is a big document, but yes, it is online. And just to follow up, um, you're visiting the NABs first and then you're visiting a couple other before going to city council. Where are you in that process? When do you anticipate getting to city council? So we've, we've basically gone through this process once, not fully, but we've been trying to elicit feedback basically for the past year. Mm -hmm. So we did go through our planning commission. We did three workshop style meetings with them, brought that information to the council to get feedback from the council on what we heard from the planning commission. And now we're coming to you as the NAVs to kind of update you on where we're at. Again, we're gonna go back to the planning commission with that full document. Here's everything we've heard since we've last talked to you. And then, so we're at October with the NABs. Next, we'll do planning commission probably in November, maybe early December. And then following that, we'll try to hit council December, January is the target at this point. Sure. Okay. All right, thank you. Thanks. Okay, we'll move into item C1 um, for need to speed, I think. Thank you. Uh, my name is Chris Sutgard. I'm the owner of Need to Speed. So got our team here with uh, Gabe Greenberg, our general manager to Milton Constructions here and JKRP's online. So <laughs> we are, um, well, first, Need to Speed, as you hopefully know, uh, if you've been around, we're a family entertainment center. We're in South Reno currently. We've been here for 11 years um, and we're looking to expand our operation and relocate up into the uh, North Town area. And we're here regarding a conditional use permit because of a bar, lounge, and tavern, and also uh, amusement and recreation outdoors. So, and that picture presents you some of the amusement and recreation we're talking about outdoors right now. Um, somebody operate the clicker, there we go. All right, thank you. <laughs> um, so what we're gonna have is of course, um, high performance carts, because that's what we're known for. Uh, we're gonna have a new multi-level track, uh, entirely new fleet of carts that'll be, um, uh, both have some additional features in terms of entertainment and then also be safer, which is great for everybody. Uh, in addition to that, we have uh, 12 lanes of duckpin bowling, an all new nine hole mini golf course, uh, approximately 60 piece arcade game, a full service restaurant uh, along with two bars, uh, private event space, which we'll see here in a moment. Um, excuse me, not the private event space and the outdoor patio and lawn games, which we'll see here in a moment. So we can scroll down a little bit and we'll run through the space. This is the old Walmart that is up in North Town. We are taking the spot next to where Planet Fitness is. Currently there's Ross on the far east side of the building uh, and Winco's further east of them. Uh, then we've got flooring liquidators in between there. That gray area that says not in contact, that is your Planet Fitness. And we are taking the remainder uh, slice that's a little neither rectangle nor square nor any other shape. <laughs> um, we slide in behind them. So if you can scroll down just a little bit, the blue area down at the bottom there, oh, not all the way, just trying to get that slide more in the frame there so that I can see it. Scroll up a little bit, perfect, right there. So the blue area there is where the cart track will be. Again, it's a multi-level um, cart track. Moving over to the left, uh, you've got the duck pin bowling area, the purple area in the middle there, uh, is the main restaurant and includes one of the, the bar areas. The salmon color is the, uh, uh, is the arcade area that leads up to the front where that orange area is the small re uh, reception area, which is what you saw in the uh, first uh, rendering we had there. The darker kind of pink purple area is the mini golf uh, area. That is part of the old garden center that is indoors. And then the yellow area is the old garden center that we're converting into an outdoor area with picnic tables, 
um, and we'll have cornhole, ping pong, and other outdoor games. Um, so yeah, if we can scroll down now, we'll see a couple renderings of all those areas. This is the uh, mini golf bar area. The mini golf holes are just kind of placeholders. Each one of them is going to be themed around a different game or sport. Um, you can see the uh, the bar there can serve both the outdoor patio area when seasonally appropriate and the indoor area. Keep rolling down. This is along the main entry. So when you come into the building, there's the reception. Then this is the arcade area running down. Kind of looks like a hallway, but it's a big passageway. So there'll be uh, arcade games all through there. Keep going down. Get, and that leads you to the main bar and restaurant area. The cart track is behind those windows. Um, and this is just a sample of the uh, what we're going to have for the menu there. And 12 lanes of uh, duck pin bowling. You can kind of see eight here, and then there's four quasi-private, two on each side uh, for event spaces, one large and one small. And so, yeah. Oh, and finally, the uh, outdoor. So there's your old garden center converted into an amusement area. So we'll have a deck around the edge, a, a hip height wall kind of separating the area, keeping it private. Uh, obviously, picnic tables, cornhole, ping pong. And uh, I think we're going to decide on giant chess as one of our games as well. So but just fun activities for outdoors. So here to answer any questions you may have. But that's what we're planning to do. Yeah, Ilya Artman, for the record, as far as the conditional use permit, is there anything you're anticipating having an issue with? No, the only two things that we were advised is that um, uh, anytime a bar, tavern, or, or restaurant, so obviously we're in introducing a bar, and then uh, amusement or recreation outdoor, um, which technically this is amusement or recreation outdoor. So, but yeah, that's <laughs> those are the only two things they brought up. And so that's uh, that's what we're doing. Gotcha, gotcha. Thank you. Uh, Sean DeGolden, for the record, I don't drink, I, I and I don't Do party. I? Yeah, hey, so yeah, I don't party. But like, if you have a bar, can you smoke marijuana in it? Is that something that they do? Uh, well, a our entire uh, everything indoor will be non-smoking. Period. Okay. And then, uh, outdoors. Um, we haven't fully looked at it. Um, the challenge is obviously with like vape pens and stuff, you right. never know what people are smoking. So we were planning on uh, potentially only have, having signs that only allow smoking in the evening hours because we don't really want it during the daytime either as we're more of a family place, only outdoors and then advise tobacco only. Now, of course, difficult to enforce that because with vape pens and stuff, I don't know what, <laughs> what people are right. pulling out. So, so if you have drinking, mm -hmm. like a bar area here, Right. Two bars. Wouldn't it be just for adults then? No. No, I'm we're I mean, this is just like a restaurant that has a bar. So most okay. of our area, I mean, and we have a big restaurant around uh, our bar area as well. So um, so yeah, we're just we have a full, obviously a full restaurant, full, you know, uh both for events and for walking customers. Obviously, we anticipate doing birthday parties for kids just like we do every weekend right now. Um, but uh, we'll also now have alcohol available for people who want it. So, and obviously kids can't sit at the bar or anything right. like that either. So, yeah. Okay. It's been a long time since I've had minors. So yeah, <laughs> I still have one of those. So. Yeah. Um, where's the event space on here? I didn't see where you. Oh had yeah. The, if we go like back Christmas up to the parties. second slide. So we have a couple of, oh, the one with the, the floor plan there. So that green uh, square, probably the only perfectly square, uh, just up above the gray area. So the gray area is the kitchen. That is a private event space right there where the mouse is hovering over. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's a closed room, a conference room, party room. Also down next to the bowling lanes, there's that other light green area. That is a semi-private event space. So you can have two lanes of bowling in that space. Um, you're, you know, for a meeting or something like that, it wouldn't be great. Right what we're doing oops sorry <laughs> what we're doing right here because you're not going to have privacy but if you're having a social gathering uh it will give you some privacy in that area um but then you still have the you know the vibe of everything else that's going on if you really want to get away and talk business then we've got that private event space thank you mm -hmm. marie rodriguez for the record um just for clarification um are you looking at the shopping center area that's at the southeast of um, 395 in McCarran, yes. where the Winco is, right? Where Winco is, yep. Okay. Um, and what are the hours 
of operation. Is that seven days a week? Seven days a week, uh, and we will be uh, opening at 11 a.m. Uh, Monday through Thursday. We'll be closing at 10 p.m. Sunday through uh, Thursday, and we'll be staying open until midnight Friday and Saturday. And you said this is for family. Um, so are there... Well, I mean... The, it, yeah, I mean, the, the, the go-kart area. Entertainment center, right? Yeah. I mean, obviously, like I say, you know, every Saturday afternoon at 3 o'clock, I anticipate having a, a birthday party, but then we may also be having uh, a corporate event mm -hmm. uh, or, uh, you know, a company holiday party uh, in the evening. And so those, you know, we can have different looks for the type of um Well, my, my, uh, question, we're my question was, um, how young does this cater to? I mean, are there things that five-year-olds would be able to enjoy or would it be just older kids like eight yeah. and nine and above what so for our carts we do have youth carts and it's a limited to a 48 inch height so at carting that's usually about seven or eight years old where they can really partake in that uh okay. with the duck pin bowling the arcade and the mini golf you know four years old can probably uh can probably uh, participate in any any of those okay so yeah thank you and um, hall too <laughs> shonda golden for the record are you going to have live entertainment there we uh, have no plans for live entertainment at this point. Um, you know, it's something down the road uh, we could potentially do in that secondary event space by the uh, by the duck pin bowling. Um, but initially, there's no plan to do that. So, okay, thank as you. I understand, we need a cabaret license and stuff for that, and we're not planning oh, to do that okay. initially. So, um, yeah, so not in year one. <laughs> thank if, you. If it's year two, I'll probably be back here talking to you, fine people again. So. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you. Oh, wait, sorry, Gabe, you had a question? Yeah, I have a quick question. I never really thought about this until now. <clears throat> um, are these vehicles uh, gasoline powered or are they battery powered? Uh, they're electric, yeah. So. Oh, electric, okay, yep. sweet deal. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, move on to C2, GSR, Reno, Arena. Morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, whatever it is, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the NAB. My name is Andrew Diss. I'm a senior vice president with Morello Gaming. We own and operate the Grand Sierra Resort. Um, we're here today uh, because we have filed for a conditional use permit to build our new arena. I'm sure you have all seen it in the news. Uh, there's a rendering of it there. The new arena is going to be home to concerts, to University of Nevada men's basketball, and other types of events. Um, the uh, parking garage that you see alongside it will, along with the arena, is gonna be part of the phase one of basically a 10-year master plan build out. Um, you can see on the, the upper edge of, of the picture in the corner, we're gonna have a top golf facility that is on our existing lake. We're gonna put in 300 units of workforce housing that's on that edge of the Truckee River in our existing lake. And we're really, we wanna bring our, our lake to life later on. Think of a Bellagio style water show with the fountains. Um, and then assuming all these different elements that we build uh, for the entire project, work out the way we think they're going to work out. Potentially, we would build a new hotel tower, which you can see next to the existing GSR um, hotel tower up there. But we're talking, you know, maybe eight, nine years down the road. Um, we have, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, this is what the view would look like when you're on 395. Um, and we're, we're playing with the exterior color a little bit rather than that champagne i think we're gravitating towards a, a nice sapphire blue color to really embody the future home of the wolf pack in the arena you go to the next slide please um, this is a view if you're coming up to enter our existing valley entrance at gsr um, you can see the lighting we're going to have a direct connect into the north end of the existing casino property that's the entrance that you enter if you're coming to um, the going to the Grand Theater for a show or going to the nightclub or the end where Chickies and Pizzas. Um, next picture, please. Uh, this is if you're coming from the north end, um, 
you, we're going to have a nice outdoor pavilion. So in the warmer weather months, you'll be able to have, you know, pregame festivities going on outside and then have a direct connect into the arena itself, but also to the existing casino property. Uh, next slide. Uh, one of the things that Lawler Event Center currently lacks is these nice public spaces that, um, you know, modern day arenas, they all have. They have restaurants and bars and suites. And, you know, in our discussions with the university, one of the things that they made clear to us is that they just don't have the capital uh, to retrofit the existing Lawler uh, to bring it up to today's standards and make it competitive with arenas that you see across the country. So this is a, a rendering of one of our club spaces that fans will be able to grab a bite to eat, grab a drink, but it's also, it's got the, the view out to the concert or the basketball game that's gonna be taking place. Uh, the next slide is just another view of uh, a similar space. Um, this one's a little bit bigger, but you can see um, it, it just brings something at, at a higher level that Lawler currently lacks. Uh, go to the next rendering, please. Uh, this is a mock-up what the basketball setup is going to look like. Uh, this will seat approximately 10,500 people. Um, you can see on the upper edges uh, around the perimeter of the arena that we're going to have um, boxes that range in size from, you know, maybe four to eight people for the smaller ones, up to 25. And we expect those to be uh, bought up by season ticket holders, but also... Uh, you know, corporate sponsors who want an entertaining space at the new arena. Um, and you have a nice mix of the club seating and we'll maintain the existing floor seating that exists uh, at current UNR games. And um, the other thing that an arena like this, for the broadcast games, this is being built in mind with um, having a, a seamless ability for all the major networks to come in and broadcast all the UNR basketball games. We have a very competitive program. Um, Coach Alford has done great things, and we expect our team to be extremely competitive moving forward, and we're going to have lots of televised games. And so putting in that infrastructure now as we build the facility is really going to broaden uh, the reach for Nevada basketball. Uh, next slide, please. This is a mock-up of what a concert setup would look like. Um, this is an end stage concert, but we will also be able to host concerts in the middle of the floor and you would be surrounded by fans. Uh, be about 10,000 or so approximately fans that you'll be able to get in for a setup like this. If you do a setup where you have seating, where that stage is set up and you move the stage to the center floor, you'll be able to get a little... Um, more fans in the building. We really pride ourselves on entertainment at Grand Sierra. The, the concerts is really our motivating force for wanting to build this project. Um, over the last 20 or so years, with the rise of tribal gaming in Northern California, uh, Northern Nevada needs something to distinguish itself and keep getting uh, visitation, driving over the pass. And we really believe that entertainment and concerts is going to be that draw. Um, and this is why we want to build that and bring it to the area. Uh, next slide, please. And then this is the last slide we have. I, I think it's important for me to address the, the circulation and the traffic. We have had several meetings um, with surrounding groups around our project. Um, number one is the Reno Sparks Indian Colony. They're the closest residential area, and they've, they've been very concerned with the impact that increased traffic is going to have on the members of the colony. And so, you know, there's been a lot of work done on this section of 395 with the on-ramps and off-ramps that NDOT has recently completed. Um, and we're really fortunate to have an easy in, easy out, whether you're coming in off the Mill Street exit, but also if you're coming off of the Glendale and 2nd Street exit. And this just shows a circulation pattern. We're still working on what the final um, traffic study is going to look like, and we are uh, we will be having that reviewed by RTC, by the city, uh, and by NDOT to make sure that everybody's happy with the ins and outs. Um, in addition to the colony, we have been speaking with the airport because the runways are fairly close to our property. Fortunately, the arena we're building on the northwest corner, um, all the flights, they go by on the southeast corner. Um, we are working through the FAA approval process as we speak, um, 
they haven't raised any red flags with us. It's just a matter of completing that federal review process. Um, so with that, members of the NAB, I'm here to answer any questions and happy to do so. Thanks. Yeah. Ilya Arbman, for the record, um, arenas aren't really my thing. Um, so, you know, just bear that in mind, but I do have some general questions. Um, can you speak a little bit more to the traffic issue, mostly because, um, you know, I grew up in the Bay Area, and when there was a basketball game at the Oakland Coliseum, sometimes you'd be stuck in traffic for like an hour, um, you know, driving up Highway 880, and it's wider than 395, you know, in some areas. So how, what are the plans, and what are the expected, say, that there's a determination that, you know, 10,000 people coming is um, going to stress the traffic. Is there a way to address that? I mean, obviously they're not going to do more construction anytime soon, probably. So what are your, what are your thoughts on what the plan is if an issue does come up? Yeah, we, we've been looking at widening the second and Glendale um, area. So when you come off the freeway, fortunately we have a lot of vacant space on our property where the big swing is that we've decommissioned where we used to have our our go-karts um and so we can come into our property if the traffic study says that hey people are going to need some more space so that the cars aren't queuing and backing up um basically all the way to the freeway um, but one of the fortunate things that we have going for us at GSR is the pre and post game opportunities uh, right now when you go to a game at Lawler everybody is arriving at the same time and everybody is leaving at the same time because you don't have you know the bars and the restaurants surrounding the venue and so people just go there for the game and then they leave and and that creates um, kind of a bottleneck situation on Virginia Street when people are currently going and then everybody sits in the parking garage at the end of the game trying to get out. Um, our hope is that people come pregame and they stay longer after the game, the same for the concerts as well. But for concerts, we really expect a lot of people to already be at the property because it's going to be hotel guests that are already here. It's, it's really for the Nevada basketball games where it's going to be locals who are driving in. Um, but the expectation is that traffic is going to be dispersed um, longer than it currently is for games at Lawler. And, and like I said at the beginning, if we need to widen and make it easier so you don't have cars backing up and queuing, that's going to make it easier. Um, the parking garage is going to be the largest parking garage in the city. And so we should have that capacity to deal um, with all the extra cars. And up to code, we're going to be 500 parking spaces above what code requires, in addition to all our surface lot parking lot that we already have. Okay, and a second question. Thank you for that. Um, so in the last slide, right, there's some of the workforce housing. Um, are there more specific plans? I mean, you mentioned, you know, workforce housing. Does that mean it's tied to the GSR property or, or is that kind of a general term for work for, you know, people living there? Is there housing connected to their job or are you using that more generally? So our ownership is very aware of the housing issues that we have locally in northern Nevada. And um, one of the issues that we run into is that it is hard not only for our team members, but for people throughout the community to afford a place to live um, that makes it easy to go to work. So the idea is we want to build 300 units. We're going to offer it up to GSR team members first. If there are units left over, then those will go out to the, the broader community if people are interested in that location. And is there... Um a general sort of affordability? Are there any numbers being thrown out for kind of AMI percentage or it anything would, like that? It would be subsidized um, for GSR team members. I see. But but for the general public market rate housing or you guys don't know yet? We, we don't know yet. It's it, it all depends on what the demand is from our team members first. And then finally, in this last slide, um, I do see a lot of trees there. Is that part of the plan? More, more trees than I think there currently are. I don't know if it's wishful thinking there. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think the architects might have taken some liberty with that, but um, it, it, we're kind of limited to what we can do along the river there because, you know, th that's a mix of several jurisdictions and we don't actually control the, the riverside parcels. Okay, thanks. Um, Shonda Golden for the record. Arenas are my thing. <laughs> <laughs> so you're gonna have the arena 10,000 seater for concerts. Um, is that going to be like, 
I know Live Nation books for you guys. So is that going to be like U2 style bands, Metallica? Because they can't go into the grand ballroom right now. That, that That's right. So Miss Golden, with, with this arena, I, I am very confident in saying we'll be able to book anybody, probably except for Taylor and Beyonce, because they need football stadiums. Okay. But this is we, we take entertainment seriously mm -hmm. and we are going to have one of the best sound and visual experiences of anywhere in the country um and so it is our intent and, and we work with live nation currently on doing a lot of our bookings in the grand theater so you know i i don't think i'm getting out over my skis by saying we will be able to attract anybody except for those stars at the very top that need a football stadium to play in so um with the new arena, are you still going to have the, the the grand ballroom? We are, yes. So you'll be able to utilize that as well. Yeah, because the economics of it, we're limited to twenty five hundred attendees uh, in the grand theater currently. Okay. So let's let, let's throw out a, a banner. Let, let, let's say it's you two, right? Um, if we were going to put you two in a twenty five hundred seat facility, the ticket price would be unreachable for most people. But, but by dispersing how much people are paying across 10,000 people, then it becomes a lot more accessible. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we, it's important for us because there's a lot of acts that just don't command an audience of 10,000 plus attendees. Right. Um, and so we're gonna maintain Grand Theater as it is. And you had mentioned the um, fountains similar to the Bellagio. Are you gonna keep that aqua golf still or that's gonna go bye-bye? So it's it's going to go by by the current version of it, and it's going to be replaced by um, think of Top Golf. So we'll have a three story. You can see it. It's it's on that left hand side where all the colored dots are right there. Uh, we'll have 50 bays. You'll be hitting over the water. We've been trying to do this for several years at GSR and. The companies that make these products, they haven't been able to figure out the tracking technology over water with the reflection of the sun and everything that goes into it. Um, they, they are finally at that point where they're able to make it work. And so we're going to be unique here in Reno where we have this uh, hitting over water. Where we currently hit the balls, that's where the fountains are going to go, um, the light show. And we intend to develop a, basically a, a promenade all along that northern edge of the lake, think bars, restaurants. There's going to be a lot of new places for people to go um, and enjoy that when the weather is nice. Wonderful. The Bellagio is my favorite hotel, <laughs> so I love that. And on a personal note, my grandmother um, worked at the MGM, and she was the head of housekeeping, and she retired from there. Wow. And when I was a single mother, I cocktailed in that room. I and. Uh, the grand ballroom they have there. Uh -huh. And I did that during football season. And so I loved the gamblers there. It was great for me as a single mom. I could pull $300 out of there every Sunday. So I have a really soft spot. And I'm a concert photographer, so I shoot in your room a lot. <laughs> and um, so I have a very special place in my heart for your property. And I'm super excited for what you're doing. I think it's going to be wonderful. Well, thank you for that. Thank you. Zach Bolton, for the record, I just got a quick question. The city and the state have been working really hard to try and get sidewalk vendors out here. Right now, there's a radius in which you can't be near um, resort hotels. Would this project expand that radius? It wouldn't expand the radius because our existing footprint that our property touches, th that stays as is. Okay. And, and that was legislation passed this previous session in Carson City. And um, you're correct that there is a buffer between where you can do sidewalk vending. But for us, we're a little bit different situation because we are kind of an island. You know, we're not, it's, we don't have a lot of pedestrian traffic going around our property. Okay, thank you. Marie Rodriguez for the record. Um, how many stories is the parking garage going to be we're currently thinking it's going to be five levels we're going back and forth on the total size um could go up could go down could stay the same okay um as part of the cup though it's the cup is only related to the arena not the garage and how many additional employees do you anticipate with this growth with a new tower with the housing, with the um, arena, um, with all these changes, how many additional employees are you expecting? So with the arena portion, 
we expect a, a few hundred additional employees and, and that will that'll ramp up depending on the events you know it's not going to be staffed at that level all the time um in, in terms of the new tower if we do end up building that like i said that, that's probably close to 10 years down the road um but that would be a significant increase in employment because we're looking at possibly 800 rooms and so you know you have your housekeeping staff and and everybody else that goes into that um i don't have a, a firm number for that because it is so far down the road and it's theoretical at this point and will it all be employees that work for gsr or will you also be using like outside for security and stuff like that because of the number if the concerts aren't every day right um, yeah well so yeah. security is because i know is, you have security yeah, yeah we we have our own but we do yeah. supplement with outside security for the larger events and when we're very busy on friday and saturday nights and i that will continue um with the addition of the new arena and then the construction jobs is the other um, major employment driver we're we're talking several hundred construction jobs like i said the the arena and the garage we hope to break ground um in the spring the arena is going to be an 18 month build and so we all we only want to go through one winter if we can so that's why we're going to start this coming spring rather than you know at the end of this year um and i'm glad that um the chair brought up the traffic because the gsr is so near the spaghetti bowl and um i drive that route it's on my way to work <laughs> um, from my house I, I go and i can take mill i can take glendale and even right now at five o'clock i'm kind of upset because my current schedule i get off at four traffic is not so bad it just changed i'm going to be getting out at five i'm not looking forward to that even with the gsr the way it is now um, that area, it's it's just not um, everybody's trying to get onto the spaghetti bowl to go home. Um, so with 10,000 additional people during events, um, how does that compare to Lawler? How many do they currently hold for their basketballs at Lawler? And will Lawler not be doing events or are they going to be changing what they're going to be doing? So Lawler's approximately 11,000 people. It's, it's a little bit larger. Um, and they Lawler will still be used for women's basketball mm -hmm. um, and for whatever else the university needs. Um, it, to your point about traffic, it's something we're very mindful of, especially, like you said, you know, basically between 4.30 to 6, that traffic going up to North Valleys mm -hmm. is, is bad. It's a bottleneck up there, and it pushes traffic all the way down to us. Fortunately, it, I we're going to have hardly any, if any, events that are going to, coincide with that same time when the traffic is bad. Mm -hmm. If you look at tip off for Nevada basketball games, it's at 7:30. Mm -hmm. Um so you you have a little bit of a buffer when the traffic is bad on the spaghetti ball and people are coming to an event at GSR. Um and one final thing, looking at the map, are you guys getting rid of the RV park or is it still going to be there? So the RV park is where you see the workforce housing, so it it will be going away. It will. Okay. Um and do you anticipate this causing, since they're going to be, oh, look, a five-level garage. I know this is currently happening um, because, like my colleague, I used to work at the GSR. And my sister worked there when it was Reno Hilton for 12 years. She was one of your assistant managers. Um, I know that we had an ongoing problem with people using it for free parking to go to the airport because they would park there, <laughs> catch the shuttle, and go to the airport. And I know you continue to have problems with this because with my current employment, I have taken police reports of people whose cars got moved due to an event and they think it's been stolen. So do you anticipate handling additional issues with this, <laughs> with more parking available? Uh, yes, because we, we currently face that, that issue because we, we do provide a free airport shuttle and, mm -hmm. and it starts early in the night and it goes till late at night, uh, early in the morning, late at night. Um, and, and we'll deal with it the same way we do if we suspect that uh, it's somebody using it for those purposes. We put a notice on the car after a certain amount of time goes by. Um, and, and I'm talking, you know, a day or two. And if nothing has changed um, and we can't verify that they're a hotel guest, then, then the car will be towed. Okay. Thank you. I have one more question. Shonda Golden for the record. With the new um, tower coming in, will you be having new restaurants in there? Yeah, uh, that that is the idea. That's that's the plan. Um, and you can see the proximity also um, 
to the promenade on the lake that I mentioned. Um, and, and the hope is that, you know, it's so close to where that new tower will be that people will just be able to come and go freely, you know, because as you said, Bellagio, some of the nicest restaurants in Las Vegas are alongside that lake. Um, and it's not always because of the food. It's because of the show that you get to see while you're dining. Maybe you guys just put it out there. Maybe Spago's. <laughs> I like that suggestion. <laughs> That's one of my favorites. So. Gabriel, my, for the record, um, I do want to say, um, I have seen that you guys have been doing a lot of events at the ballroom, which is pretty great. Um, I think that brings a lot of tourism and a lot of attention to the city that we can handle, you know, uh, events. You know, we're not just, uh, it's not only Vegas, Reno, so little, little by little, getting up there as well. Um, I did have a couple of questions regarding uh, the ballroom. Is the ballroom, ballroom getting uh, renovated at all? Uh, we're, we're always doing little things um, to keep it in uh, good form. It's There's nothing major that we have. We just replaced the carpets very bouncy and cushiony. Um, my construction team is here. They did a good job with that. But mm -hmm. um, it, in terms of AV, that there's nothing major pressing that, that we have playing because we, we just don't need it. But at the end of certain things, lifespans, we will come in and, and address it as need be. Okay. That's uh, – and um, you did uh, – on the top of the arena – with the airport and everything being, being close, I did have a question. Um, SoFi, I know it's a, it's a, you know, it's an Apple to pair type of comparison, uh, comparison, but do you guys have any plans to do anything cool on the top of the arena that can be seen when people are flying in into arena? I don't know. If that's, we're, we're sort of limited because the FAA has pretty stringent restrictions on, you know, the lighting and the reflection. And I remember a few years back, we were exploring doing solar on different parts of GSR. The issue with that is you have to align solar panels to the south and the airport is to the south of us. So you would get reflection into the cockpit and messing with the pilots as they're taken off from the airport. So, um, you know, that being said, if the, I, I think our architects are working on something that would make it unique, um, but we are fairly limited just due to the FAA. Okay. Uh, kind of thought so too, but hey, we could be hopeful, right? Um, um, I think that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I have one more thing, Shonda Golden, for the record. Since we're talking about Bellagio, maybe you consider some luxury shopping because we don't have that here at all. I we we agree, um, and and hopefully, the the type of guests that this facility is going to draw will support that. We have already the very large kind of mall area downstairs at GSR, but it's it's been underutilized because uh, we just haven't had the demand for it and. We're hoping that with these additions that we're going to build, it, it will drive that demand. Yeah, because there's a lot of locals that would like to shop. Yeah, it's a great we're suggestion. Just so limited here. Yeah, I agree. Kind of going off of that, I mean, I had to travel to Folsom to go do some, you know, premium outlet purchasing. Um, I did want to, not necessarily a question, but I did want to emphasize, I think that what you guys are doing is really great. And I think the area that you guys are working on is kind of a very blessed place to do it because um, there's been talks about doing soccer stadiums in different parts of Reno and there's been a lot of backlash, which I feel that um, I understand their points of view, but we also need to understand as a, as a community that we need to continue to grow and we need to build things that are going to attract people to continue developing the city into what we have, what we want, what the vision is of the city. And so what you guys are planning is pretty great. And I think uh, oh, I, all great vibes towards you guys. And I hope this gets done even sooner than, than expected. Thank you. Appreciate Thank that. You. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay. Looks like we might be done a little ahead of schedule here. Any board announcements? Marie Rodriguez, for the record. Um, I just want to remind every money everybody that um, city of Reno is in the middle of its fall cleanup. So um, if you have any 
electronic waste or hazardous waste. Um, we still have four cleanups scheduled on October 5th at Reno High School, on October 12th at Damani High School, on October 19th at UNR, and on November 2nd at O'Brien Middle School. So good opportunity to clean out your garage so you can park your car in there when it starts snowing. <laughs> Thank you, good reminder. Um, I'm assuming no future agenda items on here. So we'll move into item F if there's any public comment either on Zoom or in the room. Comments heard under this item will be limited to three minutes per person and may pertain to matters both on and off the NAB's agenda. The NAB may not take action upon any matter not agendized on today's agenda. When you are called on for public comment, please state your name for the record and begin speaking. The timer will begin when you say your name and you will be afforded three minutes. If you're an attendee on the Zoom meeting and would like to make public comment, please raise your hand at this time. If you're here in person and would like to give public comment, this is your, your chance to do so. We do not have anyone registered for closing public comment. All right, thank you. So seeing none, do we have a motion to adjourn the meeting? I motion. I second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Meeting is adjourned. Thanks, everybody.